I'm Chef Walter Stey, culinary ambassador to the 18th century. London Town is where Benjamin Franklin lived while he was ambassador to the colonies. We get a chance to visit Franklin's house in London, but let's now concentrate on our menu for today. We make an lettuce soup made anchovy, a venison terrine, stuffed lobster, and his famous succotash, followed by Benjamin Franklin's original Parmesan cheesecake. Let's retrace Benjamin Franklin's steps, a journey through London, and a taste of history. Lady Bespero, that was behind restoring Benjamin Franklin's home in London, was also the driving force behind the book of cookery from Benjamin Franklin, my inspiration for today's menu. So the first thing we make is his famous three lettuce soup. It's bib lettuce, it's romaine lettuce, and it's arugula. What we're gonna do here, we're gonna chop some onion really quick. I got some butter over here, onion. Garlic. So nice to cook with the dachi. Look at that. Off the fire. Then comes the anchovy. It's no color into it, it's just lanching. It smells really good with the garlic, the onion, and the anchovy. Take the romaine lettuce. The bib is next. The arugula, we don't chop at all. We just take a couple of hands of that because it's small enough. Put it in there. Salt. White pepper. Good amount of nutmeg. Because you remember, Benjamin Franklin was one of the many noblemen that would carry his own nutmeg grinder in his pocket. When you take somebody else's recipe or book and you, you play around with it and you say to yourself, what would I change differently? What I've changed differently is the stock that I made for there. I made a stock out of oxtail. The initial recipe did not have any meat on it, just had chicken stock. I feel more comfortable with the meat flavor than the chicken flavor because it held up better to the greens. This is my stock. I just take some oxtails, some root vegetables, and just cook it down nicely. We let this simmer. I told you I did some oxtail that I pulled off the meat already. I'm just throwing this into it. And then follow that by the additional lettuce that has not been blanched. While this is cooking down, I'll get ready and make the liaison. Cracking the egg here. A classical way of tying up a soup in the 18th century and still today in French cooking. It's basically heavy cream and egg yolk. Lots of nutmeg in the soup. Now I'm just waiting to get the soup up in temperature a little bit, but when you put the liaison in it, we don't want to put it back on the fire. It's not a long cooking time, obviously, because the lettuce it's very delicate. That's why the stock is so important, because the lettuce by itself wouldn't have a lot of body. And now goes the liaison. Just sensational. I'm topping off my croutons, and in the 18th century, no bread was ever wasted, so a crouton would have been a perfect way to finish a gorgeous soup like that. Chive on top, and that's it. Mmm, it's really a sensational soup. Fantastic recipe. Now let's go to London and check out uh, Ben Franklin's home. As a founding father, Benjamin Franklin was the only statesman to have signed the four documents that created the new nation. The Declaration of Independence, the Treaty of Alliance with France, Treaty of Paris, and the Constitution. His keen interest in the printing trade brought Franklin to London for the first time in 1725, when he was 19 years old. Of course, when you travel to the mother country in the 18th century, you're looking at a two to three month voyage in one direction, in a small wooden sailing ship that could get stopped every time the wind quit blowing. It was a really big deal to cross the ocean, so the fact that Benjamin Franklin did it four times is quite extraordinary. Once you got to the mother country, you were looking at staying there 
for months, if not years. And Franklin did just that. This lovely Georgian townhouse is where Benjamin Franklin lived while working as ambassador for the colonies. Built in 1730 in the heart of London, this is the only remaining home of Benjamin Franklin. In his 16 years at 36 Craven Street, a widow named Margaret Stevenson and her daughter Polly were in many ways a surrogate family for Franklin. It was a very comfortable setting, very close and easy to walk to the places that Franklin wanted to be. And his landlady in London was a wonderful friend for him. The great historian Claude Anne Lopez said that Franklin was probably not as sexually promiscuous as intimated, but he was emotionally promiscuous. He loved to create second families and third families. He loved to draw his friends and live in close community with his friends. Franklin loved his time there. So when I compiled the recipes for today's show in honor of Ben Franklin, one recipe that stuck right out of the pages was a venison terrine, which is a very French uh, sounding terrine. But I assumed with the many years that he spent in Paris as well, that Ben Franklin most likely fell in love with it and took it back to England to make it. The terrine calls for pure venison. However, pure venison terrine will make it really, really, really dry. So what I augmented a little bit is put a little ground beef under the venison and also some lard or fat back or bacon because other than that it would be very dry. So what I've done is I ground up the venison already. They want to be very generous with some what we call soft herbs. So I have some basil, I have some sage and a little bit of tarragon. A little bit of the ground beef if you want to like 30-70. 30% means the fat content. Garlic. I got some onions that can just be raw because of the cooking time. I have some mushrooms that I sauteed before already and let them cool because the mushrooms, if you leave them raw, will generate too much liquid and your terrine will not be firm. Then, as I mentioned earlier, I got some regular bacon just for flavor and also to avoid it to get really dry. I got some breadcrumbs in here. Don't buy panko. Panko breadcrumbs will not absorb the liquid. It'll be even drier. Then I crack a few eggs in here. The eggs, and I have some thyme already pulled. I got my favorite pistachio nuts, a little parsley, and then what makes this recipe so good is the cognac, and a very good cognac you want to use. Again, no brandy, this is real cognac. The flavor will stay right in it once it's later baked. Heavy cream, salt and pepper, and you guessed it, a good amount of nutmeg. The next thing I gotta do is get my hands in there. Once it's mixed really good, we put it in the terrine. We set the oven at about four and a quarter, and about 45 minutes later, in the terrine mold, it should be cooked. I'm certain that Ben Franklin, besides the statesman, was also an outstanding gourmet. Because some of those recipes that are incorporated in his book are just spectacular. So what I've done is I layered the outside of the terrine as well with bacon. You could also use cow fat or fat bag, whatever you like. You want to hit it so you don't have any holes in there once you later bake it. Then you fold the bacon over like so. You put the lid on it. So then we're going to put a little bit of water in there and that is just so that you have a little steam action on the bottom. Beehive is ready. About 45 minutes to an hour. How can you tell when it's done? when you touch the terrine and it bounces back. I'm making a very light mushroom cream and all I'm starting off is putting a little butter in my spider. And I want shallots for that because I want the sweetness, the sweetness of the terrine. So it hit a little bit, quick translucent, really quick. Mushrooms in it, any mushroom you want to use. I'll deglaze them with a little bit of uh, cognac. Again, same thing as I tell people, you need to deglaze from a separate container, you don't want to start a fire. All right, and a little bit of a chulier or brown sauce or demi, whatever you want to put into it, just a little bit. Your parsley, a little bit of cream. All you gotta do with this, have a simmer a little bit. Literally, look at how beautiful. Get my terrine out. 
You want to see it? Perfect. Let me get it out. Benjamin Franklin, I know you wanted to be an Englishman, but you would have never gotten this terrine if you hadn't gone to France. When I reviewed the menu for today for Dr. Franklin, there was a couple dishes that really stuck in my mind, such as the venison terrine and also his stuffed lobster, which I am told was one of his favorite dishes. Many places in the world call it a lobster termidor. It's very unique. I'm going to put a spider on the fire. All the spider gets is a little butter, shallots. The shallots will just be translucent. A little bit of garlic, very little. Mushrooms going there right now. I deglaze it a little bit with cherry wine. For this one, I'm not glazing it, so I'm not flaming it. I'm just putting cognac in for the flavor. Heavy cream. Dijon mustard, very important for this recipe. The lemon juice and cayenne pepper. Chop parsley right in there. While this is sitting here, I'm gonna prep the lobster. Not necessarily sure if he would have had lobster this size or not, but for today's show, we've got them. So basically, what you want to do, you make sure you don't cut yourself. And what I recommend is a serrated knife away from you. And you cut it in half. So I just put it in my big sink here. And I take off the impurities, the intestine of the lobster. You take your meat out. There we go. Take the legs off and be very careful. It's very easy to lose a finger on that. Most people don't realize when Franklin in London looked out after his own personal interest, like he was working on the land grant to have people invest in the United States. So now, the lobster I took out of the shell, you cut it, whatever chunks you want to cut it in, big, small, it's actually a relatively easy recipe once you have everything prepped. The sauce is simmering down nicely, goes in here. Then you put the breadcrumbs in. And again there, you gotta use real breadcrumbs. Don't use pango that will not absorb the liquid. And now all we do, we take that and stuff it into the lobster shell. The flavor is just unbelievable. Now comes the world famous parmesan, lots of it. And now it goes in the oven. Well, you brown it off maybe 15 minutes at maybe 350, so everything is nice and warm. All right. It's all cooked already, so you're not in danger of anything, but you want to have it nice and hot and warm. And also, you want all the flavors that are in harmony get to know each other. Dr. Franklin, in your honor, your stuffed lobster, or as I call it, lobster termitor, delicious, fantastic recipe, spectacular. One of favorite dishes of Ben Franklin was his famous succotash. Succotash normally is just corn, lima peas, and peas. He obviously asked his chefs to put a whole bunch of lard or fat pack under there, and on top of it, which I found very interesting, he finishes up with brown sugar. Maybe the vegetables in England weren't as good as they're here in this country, so that maybe explains it. What you want to do when you make a recipe like that, try to keep it all in the same size if you can. So this particular case, like the peas. And a spider already hot, you take butter and lard. The lard is already cubed. Lard, bacon, fat bag, whatever you want to use. Onions right on top. Good amount of garlic. So now we're going to saute that. And we let it render down a little bit. Gets a nice flavor out of it. Look at it, how gorgeous are those French peas. Look at those. The peas take the longest. The corn, cut it in half and then just take the knife and go down on the side. The easiest way. I have the lima peas. The 
You don't want to steal it if you can help it, because you don't want to break up the vegetable. Salt and pepper, brown sugar. A sprig of parsley on there, and perfectly done. American by birth, much of Franklin's professional, diplomatic, and scientific life was influenced by his time spent in London. Franklin got to London in 1757, five years after the kite experiment, five years after his name had exploded in the Anglo-American world. And so immediately when he got to London, he was recognized as sort of a brother philosopher of the Enlightenment. In addition to his official duties, he conducted personal business with prominent leaders and bankers of London and a number of British scientific societies and universities. At the end of the French and Indian War, Britain needed to raise taxes to replenish the treasury after seven years of conflict. The Stamp Act of 1765 was levied on colonists. The colonists broke out in raucous protests. In Massachusetts Bay, the governor's house was ripped apart board by board. In 1766, Franklin appeared before Parliament and argued against the Stamp Act, which was repealed to the delight of the colonists. And while this bolstered Franklin's reputation back home in America, it left Franklin questioning his loyalties to England. Everywhere he went, men were approaching him and saying, our colonies in America, our people in America, our subjects in America. And Franklin began to stop them and say, we are English people too. We have the same rights and liberties as you. We are all under the same king. And England is more and more thinking of them as a factory part, a resource on a far distant shore. So as revolution began to percolate in America, Franklin was summoned before the Privy Council, the king's highest ranking advisors, to answer for the colonies. When the word gets to London that the Boston Tea Party has happened, Parliament was furious and the Privy Council wanted to make an example of it. The Solicitor General tears into Franklin. He calls him a thief, he calls him a dishonest man. He destroys Franklin's reputation and seated around the room, a room where they didn't even give Benjamin Franklin a chair, are some of the men Franklin respected most and had worked with for decades, and they are sitting there laughing at him. This turned Franklin from a loyal Englishman into an American revolutionary. Diana, so yeah. great to have you on set. You know, if there is one recipe, or maybe, well, not only one, a few, but this particular one raises eyebrows all the time because people, when they tell me you're making Parmesan cheesecake, they all look at me like, you mistaken your cheese? <laughs> I said, no. It's because Ben Franklin was so enamored with Parmesan cheese that he had this particular recipe made by his chefs all along. So we're gonna start with our crust, just like any cheesecake. Here we have one and a half cups of graham cracker crumbs, one half cup chopped walnuts, adds a nice crunch, a little texture there, and also one half cup of Parmesan cheese. In the crust. In the crust. It keeps it nice and crispy and gives that good salty crunch. In addition to that, just a little bit of sugar, two tablespoons. I'm gonna give that a good little mix here just with my hand. One stick of butter. Beautiful. There we go. Nice. Get this together, and you really just want the butter to moisten the ingredients so that they stick together and form a nice crust. So now that this is good together, we're gonna pour it right into the pan. And for this particular cheesecake, we are gonna move it up the side quite a bit. It really gets nice and crispy on the edge and just looks beautiful to have the crust coming up over the top of the cake. It's an artistic display. That's right. And I would assume that Ben Franklin made sure his people would do it this way. For That's him. right, absolutely. So, handy cup measurer here. You could use the bottom of a rocks glass or whatever you have around. I think that it makes it so unique too that it's unorthodox. It's not even, so it makes it really cool. That's right. Nice and uh -huh. up the sides. Preheat your oven to 350 degrees and bake it for eight to 10 minutes until the top is just slightly brown. Just enough time for to make the filling. Just enough time, exactly. Okay. I'm gonna start with two eggs separated. So again, passing the yolk from side to side. 
Here we have six ounces of cream cheese, and we're gonna add two ounces of sour cream. Cream cheese is nice at room temperature so that it's easy to incorporate all the ingredients. One half cup of sugar. Excellent, move that around. And now we'll add one and one half cups of imported Parmesan. That's very important. None of the things in the grocery store that's pre-packaged. They won't work. You right. gotta have fresh Parmesan, Reggiano, whatever Parmesan you want, mm -hmm. freshly grated. Yes, freshly grated, very important. In it goes. Excellent. I'm just barely mixing these together as I go so I don't fling ingredients around gotcha. the bowl. Mm -hmm. And with the lemon zest, about a half teaspoon. Just fresh, gives it a nice little zing. How much? Just a good squeeze, you know, tablespoon or so. Excellent. Our egg yolks. Just give this one final mix. And then we're going to fold in the whites. Mm -hmm. This is not a New York style dense cheesecake. This is a light and airy, which is perfect to offset the saltiness from the cheese. You don't get too much. And that is what surprises people every time we have made it. Yes, it's every you're single absolutely time. right. Perfect, get those in. All right, cross looks like it's ready yes, behind me. I want to bring perfect. it up. Just going to gently mix these together. Be very careful, this thing is hot. Excellent. And this is all together now. And it goes. And you'll notice that it only fills up half of the crust around the side, which is exactly what you want. Ready in the oven. Yes, back in there, 25 to 30 minutes and you'll know it's done when the edges are nice and brown and puffed slightly and there's no wobble in the center of the cake. Let it cool until it's completely room temperature. You don't want to take it out of the pan too early, otherwise you'll lose the sides of your Plus, crust. you must invest in a cheesecake pan. You must. So the glory of that, just pushing the bottom plate right up, and there you have it. Ben Franklin would be very happy to be here today and eat his perfect Parmesan cheesecake. <sighs> Ben Franklin, you've invented many things, but this is my favorite invention from you, the Parmesan cheesecake.